Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I think some folks are still getting logged in, getting tuned into the event. We appreciate you coming. We're very excited for all that we have in store for you tonight. I'm going to give it about 30 seconds for folks to get tuned in, and then we're going to go ahead and get started. All right, thank you all so much for joining us for this evening's event, Plankton Make the World Go Round. This event is part of our Save Our Shores, Save All We Can speaker series, highlighting the immense value of all that exists in our ocean backyard and the opportunities that we have to aid in its protection. We are so glad and excited that you could all be here this evening and we have a lot in store for you. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Before we begin, I'd just like to go over a few logistics of how to use the features of Zoom. We ask that all participants please remain on mute with your video off so that we can hear and see the speakers and preserve bandwidth so it doesn't lag. Please feel free to enter any comments or questions that you might have into the chat, and we'll try to get to everyone's questions at the end of the event. We will also be using the chat to share important links to learn more about the topics of tonight's discussion. You can use the reactions button to share any reactions you may have or to raise your hand during the Q&A session at the end. Also, just so everyone is aware, we are recording this event. A brief overview of tonight's event. We'll begin with speaker background and introductions. We will continue with some speaker presentations. We will get to experience a live tour of a plankton sample dish. Then we'll take questions from the audience, hear some brief closing remarks, and that will conclude tonight's event. We have five distinguished panelists here this evening to provide a robust discussion that's sure to be informative, exciting, and even perhaps emotional as they guide us through an exploration of the beauty and vast importance of a world unseen. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to these speakers tonight. The first speaker I would like to introduce this evening is Jane Silverstein, an instructor at Cabrillo College and CSUMB and a Save Our Shores board member. Marine science, interpretation, conservation, and art have been a core part of Jane's life for 40 years. UC Santa Cruz instilled a deep passion for ocean science and conservation which was deepened during her master's in invertebrate ecology at Moss Landing Marine Labs. Jane worked for 34 years teaching marine science and conservation for the Monterey Bay Aquarium and had the rare privilege of working with the, on two volunteer plankton stations and just loved it. Teaching plankton ecology and monitoring with Nicole and Lisa at Cabrillo has been a perfect fit for Jane this past year. She's excited to be a new board member with Save Our Shores to join our fabulous ocean conservation work around the Bay and beyond. Jane, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. The next speaker that I have the pleasure of introducing is Kendra Negre. Kendra is a lab manager and technician in the Kudela lab at UC Santa Cruz. She recently did the math and realized she's been monitoring phytoplankton in Monterey Bay for half of her life as a technician, she spends her days analyzing phycotoxins and maintaining water quality sensors, including the lab's newest microscope camera robots. Her lab work continues research aimed at improving our understanding of harmful algal blooms. Kendra, thank you so much for joining us this evening. The third speaker I would love to introduce to you tonight is Lisa Utah. Lisa is a marine biologist and science educator who works for NOAA's Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, developing ecosystem-based ocean and coastal science programs. She started her career at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and conducted deep sea research at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. Lisa developed a plankton monitoring network program here in California, a long-term temporal and spatial study 
by community scientists who measure year-round phytoplankton, zooplankton, and microplastics in our near shore. Lisa, thank you so much for being here tonight. Next, I would like to introduce you to Nicole Crane. Nicole is a faculty member in the biology department at Cabrillo College. She is also executive director of the One People, One Reef program, focusing on community-driven sustainable reef management in Pacific Islands. She is dedicated to linking rigorous science with traditional knowledge and conservation. Nicole was the founder and director of the National Science Foundation Center for Excellence in Marine Advanced Technology Education at Pen Monterey Peninsula College and executive director for Camp Sea Lab, California State University, Monterey Bay. She includes citizen scientists and students in her work and is committed to enhancing citizen science across cultures and disciplines. She was nominated for a Pew Fellowship and is a fellow national at the Explorers Club. Nicole developed the Plankton Monitoring Program at Cabrillo College in collaboration with Lisa Utah to provide real world research training and engagement for students and citizen scientists. Nicole, thank you so much for being here tonight. Last, but most certainly not least, I would like to introduce you to Steve Mendel, the Executive Director of Oceans Micro. Steve is a longtime participant in scientific research, science education, and wildlife conservation. His efforts have covered a wide range of scientific activity, including co-authorship of academic papers in the Astrophysics Journal, Sky, and Telescope Magazine, founder of the Lions of Gear Foundation, dedicated to the conservation of Asiatic lions in India, award-winning wildlife photographer with the Smithsonian NYT Books and Journals, designer of an underwater 3D virtual reality camera system used by Nat Geo and by his Oceans 360 program to bring compelling virtual reality HD video to students and the public. In addition, he is now the executive director of Oceans Micro providing free in-class educational programs for high school and middle school students as a supplement to existing biology curriculums. Steve, thank you so much for being here tonight. In addition to the five panelists here this evening, I would like to take a moment to recognize all of the community plankton monitors and the Cabrillo College TAs that play a vital role in the plankton monitoring programs you'll hear about this evening and that helped to make this event possible. You'll get to meet some of these amazing people tonight throughout the event. A big thank you to Clive, Craig, Wendy, Stacy, William, Paul, Joe, Franca, Lisa, the Santa Catalina School, Pacific Grove Natural History Museum, University of California, Santa Cruz, Katerina, Chanel, Justin, Lorena, Amelia, Gabriella, Morgan, Itomi, Stephanie, and Janai. Thank you all so much for the important work that you do. Before we launch into tonight's discussion, we wanted to provide a shared definition of the term plankton so that we can all continue through the presentation under this mutual understanding. Plankton are living organisms characterized by the fact that they are drifters, meaning they can't swim against any ocean currents. This is actually why jellyfish are considered plankton. They are a very diverse range of creatures, as you will see in the next few slides. Plankton are generally split into two categories, phytoplankton or plant-like plankton, which photosynthesize, and animal-like plankton called zooplankton. We will discuss both types later in the presentation. Now that we've covered the basics, I'm gonna pass it over to Steve Mandel to kick off tonight's presentation with a bit of artistic inspiration. Steve, take it away. Sorry, I had to come off mute and I am. So thank you so much, Emily, and welcome everybody. And tonight I'm gonna to kick off by talking just for a couple of minutes about phytoplankton, and you're going to be hearing a lot more throughout the program about both phytoplankton and zooplankton. And I think all of us are very familiar with what biologists call charismatic megafauna. And those are the, the large, beautiful animals. 
But most people have little or no appreciation for what I think of now as charismatic microorganisms and it, like phytoplankton. And people don't think about them, even though without them, life on Earth, as we know it, would not exist. So the consequence of this is that we tend not to have them in our, in our minds. And we don't appreciate them. They're barely studied in school. And most important to my thinking is that we form no emotional connection to them as we might to some of the animals that I've photographed over the years, like uh, cheetahs, and, and here's a photo of a cheetah family in Kenya, or these Japanese macaques uh, or snow monkeys, and, and our very own sea otter. Who doesn't love the sea otters? So I think it's critical that we get people connected to science via their emotions. And art is one of the paths that can help take us there. So I hope tonight that you will, in addition to learning a lot about plankton, uh, gain an aesthetic appreciation for their intrinsic beauty and start thinking of them as uh, something other than little bugs in the water, ones that you normally can't see. Because very simply, uh, humans don't protect what they don't love. And so I've started photographing them in a way to hopefully make people appreciate them more. And, and I got started with phytoplankton uh, on a trip to Antarctica. I volunteered for a citizen science program that was run out of Scripps down in La Jolla to collect phytoplankton. And from this ship, we would launch zodiacs and go towards, and you'll see this in the next slide, we would go towards uh, glaciers. And because of warming, uh, the glacial melt is increasing, dumping fresh water into the ocean. And you can see little yellow arrow there, a plankton net that we're dragging it along, collecting it. And then in the next slide, you'll see that we then preserved it for DNA analysis that is now taking place in labs in Argentina and at Scripps in La Jolla. So I started thinking about photography because I'm a lifelong photographer and typical micro photographs uh, look like the next slide where you have a light background and there's a little serratium, a, a common phytoplankton here in Monterey Bay. And we can also then do a little trick and redirect the light around the sides as we've done here, illuminating these mostly transparent diatoms, which are made of silica glass and have a dark background and increase the contrast because they're a little hard to see the detail and this, and this helps us. And in the next slide, you'll see where I've now begun to apply a technique using a combination of polarized light and prisms. And this uh, provides uh, some color, some contrast and can really through the polarization and the special technique bring out exquisite detail that helps us identify the different species. Uh, and the material you see around these uh, concentric diatoms, those are broken pieces of glass, pieces of diatoms, the silica. And so it refracts light. So we get different colors, just like a prism would bend the light, the, the glass in these diatoms does also. And it creates really magnificent images. And let's go to the next one not only do we help, does it help us identify things, but it enables us to look at some of the details and appreciate the beauty of these. I mean, look at that one with the radiating uh, structures coming out. And everyone I showed this to, including scientists, really hadn't seen anything quite like this before. And this is a sample that came out of San Francisco Bay, actually. Uh, and it's uh, just absolutely stunning. The next slide, uh, we see more debris, but all these concentric diatoms, as they're called. And the next one, here's application of a different color background. And when I'm taking these pictures, I try to pick a, a color that will provide the most contrast based on what, uh, what creatures are present and what looks best and what allows us to see the most detail. And we can, in the next one, we can also use these for instructional purposes. So when we're working with students, teaching them, we can identify the genus at least, occasionally the species, but it, certainly the genus of these and um, 
label these pictures. And these pictures are more enticing because of the color and the detail than just a, a black and white image. I am also experimenting with ways to make these very appealing artistically. And uh, this was just sort of a natural little piece um, you know, that was in one of the slides. And if you go to the next slide, you see an application of a different color background and some more phytoplankton. And in the next slide, uh, you can see detail in this concentric diatom, uh, quite pronounced. And in the next one after this, uh, once again, uh, very different creatures, uh, but they're all diatoms, they're all made of silica, and it allows us to see, appreciate, and like I say, do some more in-depth analysis. And the next slide, once again, and here you can see some of the chloroplasts that uh, convert sunlight into energy that are within these. And here's a little video, and like we can roll the video. And this is a, a dead diatom, the big round one there. And the little things moving at the lower left of it are bacteria that have entered the diatom and they are eating it, they are recycling it. So diatoms die and the bacteria gets in there and recycles it and continually is breaking the down. As a matter of fact, this process of bacteria going in to diatoms accounts for the smell of the ocean. There's been a couple of scientific papers on this. And the next slide. Well, it brings us right to the end. So I, I just wanted to show you some of the beauty of these. Uh, by the way, this is a, a diatom known as Eucampia. It's sitting on a droplet of water. I saw this as one of the very first things I saw when I applied this technique and it was very moving to me. And I wanted to share this with people. So I'm planning some art exhibitions. Uh, I'm gonna make prints of these, but I want you as you go through the program to think of these creatures, not only as scientifically interesting, but also intrinsically beautiful. So Emily, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you and uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Steve, for taking us through all those beautiful images. Next, we hear from Lisa Utah, who's going to give us a global perspective of the importance of plankton. Lisa, take it away. Thanks, Emily. And I just wanna take a moment to thank Save Our Shores for putting on this program. It's incredible to bring such an incredible group of people together to talk about one of my favorite subjects, plankton. Um, let's zoom back out here into our Earth. The ocean is 71% of the Earth's surface. There are more than 326 million trillion gallons of water on Earth. Less than 3% of all this water is fresh water. And of that amount, more than two thirds is locked up in the ice caps and glaciers. In the top 200 meters is where phytoplankton, like Steve so beautifully showed, lives. Everyone take a collective breath. I can hear it. And let's thank phytoplankton because every other breath we and other breathing organisms comes from these microscopic organisms in the ocean. Also remember phytoplankton, when it photosynthesizes, pulls carbon dioxide out from the atmosphere. All around the world's ocean, there is a constant raining down of what we call marine snow. Believe it or not, there are seasons in the ocean. Sometimes this marine snow is super heavy and sometimes it's light, kind of looks like snow falling down in the ocean. We're really dependent, depending on the productivity in the water and what's going on in the surface waters with the plankton. So when we look at marine snow in the next slide, we can see that marine snow consists of phytoplankton and zooplankton and dead and decaying organisms and lots of poop. Marine snow packages up this carbon from the atmosphere 
and the dead and decaying material carries us down to the bottom of the ocean. Not only are there seasons of marine snow in the ocean, but here in our ocean, we see the largest migration on Earth happening all the time. If you look at this bottom video here, bottom blue cross section of the ocean, what you're looking at is a sonar picking up one of the largest migrations on Earth. The green is actually a layer of organisms that happens through the world ocean every day. They diurnally migrate up at night and often to feed on the productive surface water organisms that are there. We call this the deep scattering layer. In the next slide, um, when I, I wanted to show you this organism because we can't forget that the ocean is this three-dimensional environment and much of it is just open ocean water where things are floating around. There's no bottom and there's no surface. It's like being in space. And this is a picture of the organism that I studied in graduate school. Um, its name is Peobius miseris. And when we would go offshore um, from Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, we could get quickly into deep waters and when we'd go offshore, we'd be able to just get to over a thousand meters in less than an hour. And we would drop the ROV over. And as that ROV descended, like clockwork at 200 meters, this organism would appear. Never above 180 meters, but always below 200 meters. And the amazing thing is, is that Peobius is a worm. It probably evolved from being a worm that crawled on the bottom and made its life up into the water column. And I began to study these guys year round and through the seasons of the ocean, because when we would come up to it with the ROV, we would see it splayed out with these green tentacles. And those green tentacles is because Peobius has green blood and it would have mucus and all these particles of marine snow would be falling on that mucus and then it would be pulling in all these things in marine snow along grooves on its tentacles into its mouth and then down into its gut. On closer observations over the course of 14 months, I could see that phytoplankton and zooplankton parts and pieces. And the majority of its diet was actually poop or fecal pellets. So that's the amazing thing. There's many seasons in the ocean. And Peobius and all these other organisms actually take all this marine snow in, repackage it up and poop it out. And they're just taking carbon and repackaging it and sinking it out. The ocean has an incredible job in taking all the carbon out of our atmosphere. Let's zoom in on Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. It's just a small part. It's 6,000 square miles of the pro of protected area. It's unique um, in the sense that it has a deep submarine canyon. It has an underwater volcano that's extinct called the Davison Seamount. Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary was designated in 1992, and because of its incredible bio and geodiversity and its underwater maritime history and its amazing place for wildlife viewing, it was designated to be federally protected. Our mission at the sanctuary is ecosystem protection, and we do this through research and education. I want to wager in the next slide. I got to say that I think that Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary is so incredible due to plankton. And specifically, I'd say that phytoplankton, phytoplankton is arguably the most important life on Earth. That's a big, that's a big thing to say because we have plankton and we have sardines that come in and the whales that eat the sardines and the plankton. We have salmon that come in and eat the plankton. We have harbor seals that are eating the small fish 
we have sharks that come in and eat the whales and the harbor seals. And we have the squid that are eating some of the small fish and Peobius and all those other animals in the midwater eating the marine snow that makes this whole system work. Next slide. And I would say that because of this, we have some of the highest biodiversity in the world. We call the sanctuary the Serengeti of the sea. We have otters. We have all that charismatic megafauna, as well as the charismatic microorganisms. And what it does for us, not only is food that we eat, the ocean gives us those food that we eat, but it also gives us incredible wildlife viewing opportunities and recreational opportunities. So we have a lot to thank plankton for. So much. If you've seen recently, we've had over in Rio del Mar, we've had light shows of bioluminescence that are from plank phytoplankton. We've, if you go look at the Monterey formation, that is actually diatoms that have sunk to the bottom of the ocean and been compressed and pushed and formed beautiful rockscapes. Remember, plankton during photosynthesis produces the oxygen for one of every two breaths we breathe. Plankton is that smell that you get when you go out to the ocean and take a deep breath and it gives that ocean scent. In fact, albatrosses use that scent to find the food for them to eat. And even it's thought, some of the research shows that the plankton going into the atmosphere actually for, helps to form clouds. And that therefore gives us more reflection, keeping us cooler from the warming of our earth. And finally, I had to throw this slide in here because this is interesting on land. Remember, seaweeds, aquatic plants, and phytoplankton consume as much carbon dioxide as all forests on land. What we're doing on land is, in humans now is putting our forests into our buildings so that they can pull pollution out of the atmosphere, literally pull the carbon dioxide and other things and have more green. So um, anyway, this is great. I wanted to, I'm really excited to talk to you. We have a lot to thank Plankton for. And tonight I want to turn this over to Nicole Crane, my colleague, um, so she can tell you a little bit more about the big world and the small world and how they interact. Thank you, Lisa. And welcome everybody. This is a super exciting topic. Um, always gets me very excited. Um, I also want to give a big shout out and thanks here to all of the TAs and the people in our plankton program and Katrina Herman, who was involved in setting this whole thing up. So this is really a community, what we're, the, the whole endeavor we're talking about, a community of people that have really brought this to all of us. So I wanted to, to just remind us all here that the oceans are big, as Lisa mentioned, about 71% of the surface of our planet, but about 99% of the living space on our planet. In fact, it's the largest space in the universe known to be inhabited by living organisms. It's truly massive, and we know less about it, really, in many respects, than we do about outer space. And humans interact with that natural world every single day, and it has really clear and very consequential impact. I think most of us are aware of that, but I'm not sure that we really think about all the things we do and how those interactions really make a difference in our planet. And we certainly probably don't think much about how they impact the tiny microorganisms. That three-dimensional scale of the oceans means that we really don't see what happens there for the most part. Out here on land, we have a much better handle of what's happening. So not only do we not see it much in the ocean, but scientists also don't even know that much about what goes on. It's so vast. So here's my plug for the importance of community science. Um, community science is, is really, a way for us all to keep our eyes on our natural world. We cannot do it with a handful of scientists. Um, the world of the micro world of the oceans really has, has the most chapters really on our planet because it's the most space. But in a sense, we're not reading those chapters because we don't have enough people. Looking beyond whales and fish and all the big things that are right in front of us every day, 
Every single drop of water tells a story. And you're going to read one of those story chapters today when you look at live plankton. Every drop contains organisms. And each one of those organisms reflects the state of the sea. If we see a lot of dinoflagellates, for example, that carry toxins, that tells us something about what's happening in the ocean. If we see a lot of diatoms that are used by as food for other organisms, that tells us something too. Or maybe we see a lot of zooplankton and no phytoplankton, that's gonna be a story in and of itself. In addition, every single drop carries chemicals and plastics that also reflect the state of the sea. So all of these stories really can be told in one drop or several drops, but, but the real thing I wanna drive home here is that the more eyes we have on those drops, the more people we have to read that story. And that's really citizen science. This story cannot be read by just a handful of people. So the program you're gonna learn more about tonight, in addition to seeing some of those plankton, are really a way to get involved in this. So let, let's just take a little foray here for just a minute into those microplastics. So microplastics are a tiny, tiny plastic. You can't see them, but they're there in the water. And they're not just from the plastic bags you buy at the store, but in fact can come off your clothes if you have clothes that are made of plastics. Recycled bottles, which are, seemed like a great idea for a while, are full of microplastics every time you do a laundry. So we're going to take a foray here into microplastics. And it's my um, great pleasure to introduce Clive Bagshaw and Amelia Levy, and, and they've both been incredibly involved in, in developing these programs to um, monitor microplastics. So not just the living things, but also the non-living things, which tell a story about what's happening in the oceans. Um, so um, Amelia is an adjunct professor of oceanography at Cabrillo College. She holds a master's degree in applied marine and watershed science from California State University of Monterey Bay, where she studied the effects of plastic pollution on the marine environment, super interesting topic. Her research interests are in marine conservation in relation to anthropogenic or human caused influences, land sea interactions and climate change. And Clive Bagshaw is an emeritus professor of biochemistry who's used optical techniques such as fluorescence and polarization to study the structure and function of protein molecules for over 50 years. You're gonna see how he applies some of that to the microplastics here in just a moment. He held a lectureship at the University of Leicester, England for 30 years and retired, quote unquote, to UC Santa Cruz 10 years ago, where he's an honorary research associate at UCSC using microscopy to study telomerase activity. His outside interests cover all things related to natural history including his recent, recent discovery of the wonders of plankton and how basic microscopes can be upgraded to enhance their visualization. Um, Clive has been um, very much responsible for what you're gonna be able to see tonight, which is um, basically um, using these microscopes um, really, really for a lot of very detailed work, um, inexpensive systems. So we're happy to share that with you too, if you're interested in getting involved. Okay, Steve Mandel is gonna be interviewing Clive and Amelia. Well, good afternoon, Clive and Amelia, and I wanna thank you so much for agreeing to let me interview you about this very important topic of plastics in the oceans. And our time is short, so I'm gonna jump right into this. And Amelia, if it's okay, I'm gonna begin with you. And sure. I'd like to ask you, what sparked your interest in microplastics? So um, for me, I, it started with an internship with the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary under the direction of Lisa Utah. And I was tasked with finding an inexpensive but rigorous method to identify microplastics in the plankton toes that the plankton monitors were doing for the program at the time. And then once I got into the project, I quickly realized my passion for reducing plastic pollution. Yeah, so I also joined the, uh, the learned about microplastics through Lisa Utah's program. Um, and when I started collecting plankton in 2018 and filling out the uh, record forms, I saw there was a box for microplastics. And I discussed with Lisa then about how we might identify them. And uh, it was mainly just based on if it looks like microplastic, then it's microplastic. And so I started playing around with polarization methods which I know picks up plastics. And then within a few months of that, she put me in contact with Lisa. Uh, sorry, Lisa put me in contact with Amelia. And uh, 
realized that we needed to get things moving a bit because uh, Amelia had a couple of months uh, to get a project up and running. So that's when we started focusing on other methods such as using Nile Red fluorescent dye. And that turned out to be reasonably successful. And, and I see that on your t-shirts. Is that the Nile Red t-shirt you both have? There we go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's great. Okay. And, and let me ask, uh, and I'll, I'll, Clive, I'll throw this one at you. Just how bad is the contamination in Monterey Bay? Well, there's a, a recent paper. It's actually hot off the press. It's uh, coming out in print in uh, this month from Castle Bar Wabari et al., uh, based on sampling in the Monterey Bay. And they came up with a figure of one to three microplastic particles per cubic meter of seawater. Wow. And uh, the higher end, the three, was off the Santa Cruz uh, boardwalk area. So it was interesting because we were already collecting microplastics at that point, and we've not done a, a, a proper count, but just from the fact, the, from the frequency with which we see them in our samples, we calculate that it's near 100 uh, particles per cubic meter. Uh, but the main difference is, I think, uh, from the filter size, they were using a, a net with a mesh of 335 micrometers, and we were using a mesh net of 20 micrometers, and so we're picking up many smaller particles. And one of the things about microplastics, every time they split into smaller uh, smaller particles, you get more of them. So the, the problem gets worse in terms of numbers. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing more particles for that reason. So that, that number is kind of average. The, the numbers are all over the place in the literature, um, mainly because of the different techniques and the different filters used to uh, isolate the plastics. I see. Um, and to add to what Clive was saying, um, there was a paper that came out, um, Ambari published a paper in 2019 that stated that the density of microplastics in the midwater range in the Monterey Bay were <clears throat> higher than the density of microplastics in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, Wow, which is, a, it's a pretty big deal. It's a, it's a very big deal. Yeah. And, and Amelia, while I've got you here, what, what happens to microplastics uh, once they are in the ocean? So there's a number of things that can happen to microplastics once they get into the ocean. Um, some of them will float on the surface and collect in garbage patches and along coastlines. Some will sink to the bottom and eventually become part of the sediment there. Um, the main problem stems from the microplastics getting consumed by small plankton and filter feeders. And this can cause intrinsic problems for the animals themselves, but it can also eventually wind up on your plate, which is something that most people can understand and not really like the sound of. It's a microplastics are ubiquitous. The problem is just getting that message out to the larger public. And that's where we hope to make an impact. So I, I just wanna say thanks for letting me interview you. And I wanna learn more about this myself and I just really appreciate your time today. So thank you. And thanks for the great work that both of you have done. It's fantastic. Thanks, okay, Steve. Thanks, Steve. All right, now before I turn this over to Lisa, you're gonna, you're gonna learn a little bit more here about how you can get involved. And before I turn it over to Lisa, I just wanna let you know that if you're interested in getting more involved with some of Save Our Shores work, um, aiming to reduce the impacts of plastic pollution on our National Marine Sanctuary, you can become a sanctuary steward or a long-term Save Our Shores volunteer, or consider signing and sharing our plastic bottle petition. So the links for each of those will be placed in the chat if you wanna learn more. Lisa. Thanks, Nicole, and a thanks, Amelia and Clive. Amazing work that you guys have done on behalf of make, helping us to monitor our ocean. Um, this slide that you're seeing here is a slide, it's probably about uh, five years old at least, and these red dots are indicator of a citizen science program that's been going on on the East Coast. And volunteers go out and they're monitoring phytoplankton. Well, you can imagine, I thought, wow, only the East Coast, what's going on? And you can see here in California that there were no citizen science phytoplankton monitoring. We have incredible research that I'll touch on, but there were no sites for phytoplankton. 
And one of my goals was to really um, just not monitor phytoplankton, but also to monitor zooplankton and microplastics. Next slide. And it was about four years ago that NOAA's National Center for Coast Ocean Science, who are our partners, and the California Department of Public Health, and UC Santa Cruz Cudella Labs, their biological oceanography lab, and even doc Dr. Mary Silver and O'Neill Seodacy and held a, a, a meeting of the minds, if you will. We brought scientists together with educators, with uh, some of the NOAA monitoring um, data centers. And we talked about how can we get monitoring going on our coast? And that was the, the sort of birth of the network. And then subsequently, uh, we decided to train a variety of different groups. So we trained places like Santa Catalina School, the Pacific Grove Natural History Museum, and they uh, adopted plankton monitoring with their volunteers. And most importantly, uh, thanks to Nicole and Cabrillo College, we were able to integrate a monitoring program into a course, and you'll hear more about that. Next slide. Since probably 2016, we've trained, we have these different locations where, flight, where plankton is being collected by citizen scientists, community scientists. And the hope is that this is happening in most cases weekly. And so you can see here that we have good spatial or and temporal over time. So we can look at this data set down the road 20 years from now. I hope that scientists and people will look at this data set as a monitoring so we can see changes of plankton in the ocean when we can see that nowadays we're seeing a lot more dinoflagellates during certain times of year than I saw certainly uh, over 20 years ago when I did my research. So this is sort of category. You guys are our eyes and ears. Uh, we can't do it all, you know, and get it all. So this is sort of a real time way that you as citizens can get out there, you as community scientists can get out there and collect plankton. Okay, so I'm just gonna walk you through some of the work we've been doing with Lisa and others here to develop this program. Um, Cabrillo College has a, 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 a training program, if you wanna call it, I'll tell you more about that in just a moment. Um, it's a partnership with the sanctuary. And essentially we're enabling all of us to expand this network of monitors. Um, and a big part of that is to create the training and the experience needed um, around that effort. So this is a data collection effort. We're required to all follow the same protocols so that when we're collecting the data, we're all basically speaking the same data language when we put it into the computers. And this requires training. So Cabrillo provides this um, amazing platform for training. It's really a natural way to organize a community of scientists. And I know you can't probably see them all in that picture, but this class is incredibly diverse in terms of people's backgrounds, people's interests, people's ages, people's um, jobs and interests. It's really been incredibly enriching and wonderful. So the courses that we developed are Bio 450 and 451. And this is really a, um, it's a class, but it's really a certificate program. It's non-credit, it's no fee. So students can enroll in this class to gain real world internship experience. It's actually set up really to be like a citizen science. It is in fact, a citizen science program. Students are getting experience. They're gaining skills and knowledge and people in the community who have skills and knowledge are joining this and sharing those skills and knowledge with us. Okay, next, next slide. So in the field, um, the students gather in teams at different sites. So we've had anywhere in the past from three to four different sites, the Santa Cruz Wharf, Capitola Wharf, and the Harbor. Um, we used to do it at Seacliff until they closed it. Um, so we're out in the field. This is Madeline there collecting some samples of plankton. Um, next slide. We have a video of plankton sampling. So 
the students, and even during COVID, we've been able to um, keep this going. Uh, students will um, adhere to pretty strict, very strict actually COVID protocols out at their sampling sites. Um, this is the Santa Cruz Wharf particular site. This is Steve Mandel's drone here, giving us a nice um, view of what students are doing. So you can see they're gonna be putting down two nets. One of them is a zooplankton net, collecting little larvae and zooplankton and copepods. And the other one is a phytoplankton net. So the two nets have different mesh sizes, enabling them to capture these different kinds of organisms. And they're gonna be uh, moving those nets up and down at a very particular number of pools and a very particular method. And then when they're done, the nets will come all the way up and all that water that's been funneling through the top of the net is gonna end up in what's called the cod end, which is the, the sort of grayish PVC thing that you're gonna see here in just a sec at the end. And that's gonna be harboring all the little critters that we're gonna take back to the lab and look at. Here's Lorena and Jasmine. And they're gonna show us here as Jasmine's gonna open up the cod end. So you see all the plankton have been concentrated in that end um, as Lorena has been pulling the net up and down in the water. So this I'm gonna guess is a phytoplankton net just by looking at the color of it. They can get kind of stained and funny from all the little organisms. So watch as Jasmine pours this into the glass. It's glass, not plastic, because you can get plastic bits if it's in plastic. So it's a glass pie. Look at the color of this. Look at that nice rich sample. So a lot of those pigments you're seeing, the colors are called fucoxanthins and they, they have this lovely golden color. So this tells us we had a lot of phytoplankton in that toe. Okay, next slide. So in the lab, then when we're meeting in the lab, um, we'll take those samples back to the lab. And you can see here on the left, Darius is actually doing the microplastics technique that Amelia and Clive just told you about. And he's looking specifically for microplastics using Nile Red in that sample. And Faith over here on the right is looking at plankton and doing plankton counts. Okay, next slide. Um, during COVID, I just wanna put this out there because it was really interesting. Here's Lorena. She's actually, this is a screenshot. She's um, she's got a microscope set up at home and she's broadcasting this toe to her team, which was out there in the field with her collecting it. Um, and she and her team together are counting the different organisms and um, entering the data into the data sheet. So we're able to keep going during COVID via Zoom. Um, first, they broadcast to their teams and then we come back and, and talk about it as a larger group. And what this has enabled us to do, we didn't really think about this, but it's been so rich for us. We've been able to expand our reach to include people from the Bay Area, people from Monterey, people from all over, Janai being one of them, who have incredible wealth of information and who are able to participate in this community that meets every Friday morning, collects their plankton, and then really just geeks out, um, uh, just having so much fun seeing what's in there. And then what we love about this is that at the end of every day, we get to read that story. We come back together, we say, what's going on? Looks like a lot of nutrients, looks like a lot of toxins, looks like a lot of whatever. So we can really read a story and we can do that over seasons. And so that story changes every season in the bay. The season here is just like any seasons. You just can't see it in the water unless you look at these plankton. And then we can see seasons just like you can see in fall, spring, winter. It's fascinating. Okay, next slide. And then in addition, there's some, some really amazing work going on here in the Bay, as many of you know about, but the uh, Marine Protected Area Collaborative Network, which Lisa and I co-chair, um, also has access to this uh, little mini remotely operated vehicle. And our plankton class, this is Lorena, Jasmine, looks like Morgan, maybe, and Justin got a hold of that, learned how to use it, got trained in it. And then we use that to poke around under, this is at the harbor, to see what else is out there at the site where we're collecting our plankton. Okay, next slide. So um, we really welcome uh, uh, involvement in this class. For students, this class is like an internship, so they can use this as an internship, like a letter. They can also get a certificate from the state with this class. Um, and other people can just be involved as citizen scientists, learn about plankton, get involved in learning how to sample it, and then being an extra set of eyes to help us learn about the oceans. So really it's open to anybody who's interested in plankton. And it's uh, free and it's non-credit, so there's no exams or any of that stuff, um, and there's no grades. So it really is set up as a skill-based class to get us involved in learning how to do the monitoring. Okay, um, now I'm going to pass this off to Kendra. No, this is going to pass it off to Jane, who's going to talk to us about zooplankton. 
me. No, it's Kendra. Oh, Kendra, sorry. I'm going to talk about myself to Kendra. Kendra. <laughs> Hi, Kendra. First Kendra, then Jane. <laughs> okay, so we've heard a lot of compelling reasons about why we care so much about plankton. Um, and I just want to talk about some numbers really quick before to really drive home some of these points. And so in the ocean, there's this size paradigm where the larger the organism is, the fewer there are of them. And so when you, I've circled here on the left, the things that we can actually see with, easily see with our eyes. Um, and so those are things like whales and sea lions and fish. Um, and you can see that that actually makes up a small portion of life in the ocean. And a lot of, and most of it's made up of these smaller organisms. And so in two liters of seawater, what you're gonna see is probably trillions of viruses, billions of bacteria, which we're not even covering today, then millions of phytoplankton and thousands of zooplankton. And when you start doing the math, because my back of the envelope calculation was like a humpback whale takes up about 20,000 two liter bottles. You can see that not only are these organisms, vast, or the numbers are just huge, but as Nicole touched on, because of the three dimensionality of the organ of the ocean, we can't actually see what's happening because of the depth, but also because all of these bottom level trophic interactions are happening at a microscopic scale. And so let's talk some more about phytoplankton. Phytoplankton are primary producers. Um, they take light and nutrients and they photosynthesize and generate oxygen. Um, We're going to look at a phytoplankton sample, or sorry, a plankton sample later. Um, and what we're going to see is probably just because of the magnification of what I consider the larger phytoplankton. Um, and by large, I actually mean like half the diameter of a strand of your hair. So it's super huge. But these larger phytoplankton are divided into two groups for the most part, diatoms and dinoflagellates. Steve did a great job covering diatoms at the beginning of his talk. Um, and he mentioned that they are made of silica. They have very hard cell walls. Um, no, yes, hard cell walls. And I think of them kind of like mini greenhouses. They can't move. And so they largely use their structure or their morphology, the shapes of the, how they are to stay in the photic zone so that they can get light um, for photosynthesis. In contrast, dinoflagellates are mobile because they have two flagella, one that wraps around them like a belt and another one that comes off like a tail. And if you look really closely, I don't know if you can see it, but the image on the upper left-hand panel of the dinoflagellate, you can see kind of this line coming out from the bottom of it. That's the flagella, the tail-like flagella that helps them swim. Dinoflagellates are made of, uh, their cell walls are cellulose. And I've been trying to think of like a really good analogy for that, like greenhouse, but I couldn't. And the best one I came up with was thinking about like the plastic bag that your bedding comes in. And so it's contained and you can see in the lower extreme left and extreme right portions or pictures up on the screen that it's actually the shape and how these cell walls that are made up that we've classically used to identify phytoplankton down to species, um, which means that you need usually significantly higher powered microscopy. So those are both EM electron microscopy images because size and shape that we can see with a standard microscope isn't always enough. And that's why oftentimes somebody will ask us what with something is and we're like, well, we think it's this because separating things just off size and shape isn't enough. And so we might not be able to see individual cells with our eyes, but you can actually collectively see phytoplankton through color. And so if I asked you what color the ocean is, the answer would probably be blue. I would say blue personally. And that's actually true in places like Hawaii where the water is clear and it's blue and it's beautiful. But in a more productive ocean system like Monterey Bay, we don't often see blue water like that. And so the middle picture there is uh, at the M1 buoy, which is kind of halfway between Monterey and Santa Cruz. And that is from probably one of the bluest days I've ever seen out on the bay. And you can tell in comparison to the Hawaii picture that there's a lot more green in the water and that's because there's a lot more stuff. And to get more extreme, if you take a picture of the water at Santa Cruz Wharf, it is oftentimes green. 
And it's green because there's a lot more, part of the reason why it's green is there's a lot more phytoplankton in the water. And so you can see from the inset there, which was weekly pictures um, from March, 2021, so last month. And then if you look across the bottom, that's actually the timeline from 2020, January on the left and December on the right. You can see there's a lot of variation in green and that is largely being driven by the phytoplankton, the amount of phytoplankton that are in the water. And this, these changes in the color is actually how we use satellite data to better understand the oceans on a larger scale. And so day to day, we think of the water color being green, but there are times when there are so much in the water that it looks a lot like the net toe that was being poured out um, by Jasmine in that video you just saw. And essentially that's a bloom, it's a bloom of phytoplankton because it's, and in the netto it was just a concentrated um, sample. But when there are a lot of cells in the water, there's the potential to actually discolor what we can see. And so if you look in the upper left-hand corner, that beautiful picture is the coccolithophore bloom that happened a little few years ago. Um, coccolithophores are, have cell walls made of calcium carbonate, which are white. Um, so when there's a coccolithophore bloom, it makes the water a little bit milky in color and then also very, very bright because white is so reflective. All of the rest of these pictures on this slide are red tides from around the area, at least the central coast, I think. Um, and it's important to know that when you look at these, you can't really tell what organism is blooming. And just because there's a red tide doesn't make that harmful. So the actual only pictures that are, or the only examples here of harmful algal blooms are on the very, very right-hand side. Um, there was a bloom of Akashuo that caused a bird die off and a bloom of Ganiolex that caused a shellfish, um, Abalonian chitons, I believe, um, die up up on the North Coast. But here's where monitoring is, and community monitoring is actually really important because we, with the help of volunteers and the community, we can actually track these blooms better, both over a greater geographical range because everybody's able to, go, able to go out to multiple locations and also temporally as well. And so some of these blooms can come up and die off in less than a day. And so if we have more people monitoring more frequently, we can track these dynamics significantly better. Um, I'm not gonna talk much more about HABs, but if you wanna know more, Save Our Shores had an event last year um, and the link should be in the chat um, to see that um, if you want to get more information on both of those topics because they go into great detail during that event. Um, last, I'm going to talk about demoic acid. I know I said I wasn't going to talk about HABs anymore, but Pseudonychia was my first and favorite harmful algal bloom species, so I had to include it. But there's another food web. So Lisa put one up earlier to drive home the point that phytoplankton are really the drivers of the ocean. And that's really true because Pseudonychia is a diatom. It produces a neurotoxin called demoic acid. And demoic acid, like all the phycotoxins, bioaccumulates through the food web. And so by the time you get up to the trophic levels, because of all the filter feeding and all of the number of smaller organisms that you eat as you go up the food trophic levels, you end up having a lot of toxin exposure with a lot of impacts at these higher four at these higher trophic levels um, so we see impacts from mammals and birds and people although less health issues with people and more economic issues when it comes to people because of closures um, so we think of ocean health as um, or at least I do, I hear a lot about it in the news when, and people are talking about these char charismatic megafauna. Um, but really, like I said, Lisa drove home pretty early um, on in this talk. These, the health of these organisms is largely being driven by the phytoplankton that are in the water. And so now I'm gonna pass it off to Jane, who's gonna talk to you more about zooplankton or the animal plankton in the ocean. <laughs> Thank you, Kendra. Wonderful talk. Um, so I put up this quote by Cahill Gibran, the in one drop of water are found all the secrets of the endless ocean, because it's so true that when you look at the ocean, if you think about just looking at the ocean, all we see is the surface. And so most of everything most people know about the ocean, are 
the marine mammals coming to the surface for a short while or the birds or the um, you know fishes if, if uh, people have a chance to go out. Um, and so learning about these microscopic animals really helps tell the story of the whole ocean. And I just got captured by their stories. If we look at the, um, I'm not sure which side it is for you, but the top left, the, um, yes, there we go. Um, is that not marvelous? It is a larvae of a shrimp, a shrimp that's found in Monterey Bay, not right at the surface, but kind of in the midwater, uh, down maybe several hundred feet. And they have huge eyes because they have to see where it's dark, but bioluminescent, things that are glowing. And then in the middle, we have the jelly, Colobonema, and its trick is that it can release, if a predator is coming after it, it can automatically release glowing tentacles while the bell, that's only the size of kind of a walnut, uh, jets away and can regrow those tentacles and the predator gets a mouthful of glowing, you know, tentacles that sting. And then on the far right, that one I just had to include because it is so bizarre and so beautiful and becomes a really kind of boring, and I can't believe I'm saying this, I am the worm, worm person, uh, formerly at the aquarium, but it's a worm-like animal. Um, but the larvae is marvelous. And so all of these animals, uh, down to the copepod on the bottom right, um, copepods are the very base of the food web. And here in the Bay, Lisa talked about the largest migration on planet Earth. And the copepods are part of that. They are migrating hundreds of feet every day. So they're coming up to the surface. Right now, if we went out and did a plankton tow, we would find a lot of Calamus copepods on the surface because during the day, they're hiding from visual predators. And they come up and they're grazing, using all these fine app appendages, grazing on the abundant plankton. And so I just got captured by the stories. And so if we go to the next slide, um, we'll see that we too are part of that food web. And if any of you enjoy eating salmon or anything from the ocean, um, it ultimately depends on phytoplankton and zooplankton. You know, you can see the image of the um, salmon eating the sardines or anchovies. And those anchovies or any of the smaller fishes are eating the animal or zooplankton. And those zooplankton are eating the phytoplankton, which ultimately, you know, depends on the sun's rays to produce their own food. And uh, a friend of mine at the aquarium used to say that eating um, a salmon is like getting a belly full of sunshine. And so it's so true because of the phytoplankton. And if we go to the next slide, uh, there's two major categories of animal plankton. Uh, the big group is called the holoplankton, meaning whole. They spend their entire life as drifters. So plankton just means that they, they don't swim strong enough to move beyond the major ocean currents. And so things like krill in, on the left and copepods and most jellies, the Medusa stage, are at the mercy of the major ocean currents. And they um, are always in that water column. They never settle out on the seafloor. And if we go to the next image, the animals that we know and love from the tide pools, like the bat stars and the sea urchins and the crabs, all of those animals are sending their either gametes or their larvae, depending on the animal. Um, and it is a big risk, you know, for the bat stars, you may have seen in between each one of their rays, the male will send out what looks like white smoke 
coming out in five different pores and that will start the females sending out the kind of orange, much thicker eggs. They unite in the water column and go through very quick, um, you know, mitosis and become the first stage in the life of the bat star. So they look like this at first. And what you can't see is they're filled with millions of cilia and they are bringing in, creating a vortices to bring in that phytoplankton. And so they're just growing and growing. And then in a couple of weeks, they get to this stage. And this stage is very quickly going to this stage, which is amazing to watch because it, I actually saw it happen at the uh, aquarium uh, with the scope where we were watching this stage of the late stage in the bat star um, larval development. And if you can see the little kind of little um, knobs on the fingers at the top, I wish I could point to it, but um, it's no over on the, to the left. Yes, there we go, right there. Um, and it's amazing that they will taste the substrate and find the best place to settle down and we actually saw it settle. Those, you know, the, those two little fingers, you know, have suction cups, they suction on. And then down below, there were some actual suction cups that also, you know, settled. And then the whole, you know, larva that's been carrying it around for a month just drifted away and the little juvenile sea star attached to the bottom. And so pretty amazing life cycle that all of these animals are going through. And so if uh, you've had a chance to go to the tide pools, um, you know, like the local pools here in Monterey or anywhere along the coast, uh, next slide, uh, you have probably seen something like this. Monterey Bay and this whole Eastern Pacific coastline is so rich and diverse because we are an upwelling center we're in an area where that nutrient rich water comes up and just creates an incredible diversity because of the hard substrate around Monterey side. You know, you'll see things like this where there's literally not a millimeter of space available. And so what do they do? They have to send their kids off just like we send our kids off to college. I have my twin boys that, should have been off in college this last year, being juniors in college, but uh, one of them is. Uh, the other one is studying from home, but uh, you know, there's not enough room uh, at home. So they have to send off their larvae into the water column. And they amazingly, if they don't get eaten, will find a place to settle down and call home. Next image. Um, and so all of these uh, drifters or you know, zooplankton have amazing adaptations for their life as plankton. And in just a minute, we're gonna have a chance to look at the plankton, but I want you to really look at these images and uh, what do you notice? You know, what do you see in this larval fish, larval little worm, polychaete, a crab, zoea, and a little copepod? You know, you probably notice that they're transparent. They blend in with the water column. I see cilia, absolutely. They have um, tiny little appendages, cilia to move them through the water. They have the um, CT for um, creating surface area so that they uh, stay up in the water column so they can eat the phytoplankton. Look at that. The um, porcelain crab zoea is something you wouldn't want to take a bite into. So some of the things might be for anti-predation um, as well. And then finally, just uh, want to realize that so many people have come before us. You know, since the 1800s, uh, Ernest Heckel has a fabulous book uh, with his illustrations. And you can see the last, the... Uh, um, you know, brachialaria 
stage of the sea star kind of galloping and celebrating the fact that it's about to become a sea star. And um, I just appreciate all the people who have turned me on to, uh, you know, Plankton and, um, you know, all the people that came before. And now we're going to have a chance to actually delve into the plankton samples that Steve Mandel and Morgan uh, are going to share with us. And so I'm very excited to see what's out in the bay today. Let's look. Great. Thank you so much, Jane. And thank you so much to all of our panelists for giving us such a well-rounded overview of the world of plankton. We're now going to have the unique opportunity to view a live water sample that was collected only hours ago using the methods we learned of earlier. Our panelists, Steve Mandel and Plankton Monitor Morgan Rector will be sharing their screens to allow us to get a microscopic view of these amazing creatures as panelists Kenjana Gray and Jane Silverstein talk us through what we're seeing. As questions arise, please feel free to enter them into the chat and we will also have Plankton Monitor Janai Southworth monitoring the chat discussion as we go along. All right, let's pull up these samples now to get a better sense of what's swimming along our shores today. Sweet. Ah, I right. saw a little, uh, I saw a little copepod zoom by. Oh, and a polychaete larvae that we just saw in that image. Oh, and you can see the CT going out, you know, like, I don't know, like a rake <laughs> or a fan. There we go. Oh, and what's that, Kendra, in the middle? So there's a whole bunch of stuff in here, actually. That thing is Catoceris. So if you look really closely, sorry, look. Um, can we zoom in a little, Morgan? Yeah, it's a little bit sad looking because it's lost all its chloroplast, but um, that is a chain of Catoceris. It's got this deep third arms that kind of stick out, so it looks like a centipede. Oh, there's one right next to it to the left. Yeah. And so Catoceros are super cool because that, to me, that I have no scientific evidence of this other than observation. Um, but Catoceros usually signals the sign of the beginning of spring bloom. So upwelling happens. It's all the wind that's been happening lately. Uh, brings all that cold nutrient-rich water to the surface. And then phytoplankton grow. And Catoceros is generally the first one that comes up because um, it's I consider it to be a super weedy species. <laughs> we can zoom out again and start looking around. Hey, I've got something over on, on my scope. Can we switch over for a moment? Yeah, definitely. Here we go. Um, go ahead, Steve. Ooh, look at the Odontella. So tell Odontella us about is that. super cool because, so it's a diatom. Um, Catoceros is also a diatom. I forgot to mention that. But, um, Odontella is just, it's super pretty. I love it because uh, it, when you zoom out, if you could zoom out, you, I know you can't, but if you zoomed out, it would look like this long piece of lace because it's got those holes. And so the individual cells um, are actually just that colored part. And then they're connected by, mm, I wanna call them, I don't know, arms. And then they have like this X in the middle. So they've got the sides that connect them. And then in the middle, in that center part, it's actually like an X. And so if you looked at an individual one, it would have two branches and then the outside. And that's how they all stay together. Nice find, Steve. Go ahead, Morgan. <laughs> We're so lucky to have two people projecting. I know, Steve and got I'm excited because we have samples from both the North and the South Bay. So I know Steve got his from Santa Cruz Wharf this morning. Um, and I believe Morgan got hers from Monterey. Monterey Wharf, that's right, this yep. afternoon. So here we go. Here, back out. So if you see all those balls, like, so there's a lot of stuff in the water right now. And part of it's because there's a Catoceros species called Catoceros socialis. And so that's some of those balls where you can see more defined, more like brainy looking things. So imagine a chain that's making these curly cues all around and then they form this massive ball. Yep. 
but there's also some phaocystis in here too. And so it's hard, if you're not paying attention, it's kind of hard to get them confused because the actual cells themselves look really similar. So phaocystis is just this tiny cell and they farm these giant mucus balls together. Um, and they're actually, someone was making fun of me last week because phaocystis is sort of infamously known as my nemesis because when I process the water in the lab, I filter it onto a filter pad. And when there's a lot of phaocystis in the water, all of that mucus clogs on my filter pad. And so like today there was a lot of phaocystis and it took twice as long for me to filter my normal samples. Oh, look, there's a serratum. <laughs> Can we zoom in a little bit? Sorry. I'm gonna zoom. And is that, is that protoperigenium that I saw kind of zooming around? I don't know, it may have been. I know there was some out there. Yeah. The question came up, Kendra, about an estimation of how many organisms are in the video that Morgan's showing. So, I don't know, I, how many? Oh my gosh, is that a, an ephyra? Maybe. Or is, no, that's a little jelly, a little medusa. Oh, neat. So if you look to the right of there, there's something that looks like it's pointing at that. That's actually a rhizosilinia. And that's cool today because I saw them. So they're these super long diatoms and then they have these pointy ends. And I never realized this and I'm not sure, I'd have to check. But today there were so many in the sample that I saw them like with their point or the tip of them right at the surface. And then they were like hanging down. And so I was wondering if that was like a, morph a morphological feature that actually helps keep them at the surface. So they're using surface tension, kind of like how bugs walk on water to keep them up at the surface to get the light for photosynthesis. So cool. Okay. And then, whoa, 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 can you go back? I'm sorry, oh, sorry. Morgan. That, um, so you can see this is a tiny jelly and the uh, mouth is in the middle. I don't know if you can point to it, but uh, the mouth is in the middle, there you go. And then the tentacles, oh, perfect, on cue. You know, <laughs> these are the, the true jellies that, uh, you know, have the nematocyst or stinging cells. And you can see it is pulsing and you can see little eye spots in there as well. They just are able to tell light from dark. So they know whether they are going um, up towards the surface or down towards the bottom. And uh, this one is looks like a very young one. Very I've, I've actually got a larger jelly over here too. Oh. Let me zoom out. Um. Oh, wonderful. Beautiful. Now you can see the food, the, you know, some sort of, uh, whether it's a diatom, dinoflagellate, but definitely has the, uh, you know, probably more of a dino, right, with the golden color. Um, but you can look right into its stomach. You know, this is the mouth with the, the lady, the lips here. And then you can see the radial canals coming uh, from the very top down into the uh, base of the, the rim of the, uh, of the jelly. And then the tentacles are rolled up. Um, we, it's kind of difficult to tell which species it is. We, uh, we think we know what it is, but we're not sure. Um, Dave Robles book on Pacific Coast Pelagic Invertebrates is a great one for uh, looking for it and uh, it looks like it is the um, oh, Clydia, uh, um, which is a common, common uh, hydroid jelly. So that you can see that it has um, this little area, I don't know if you can point to it, Morgan, right uh, where the tentacles come from, you know, each of them, yes, right up, you know, the, um, the bulbs, right where the tentacles come from, yes. So that's where, they have a little statocyst that is just like uh, something that you put on your wall to figure out if it's, um, you know, it's straight for doing uh, building. It tells whether it's up, you know, whether it's right side up or upside down. There's a little eye spot uh, in there as well that's kind of hard to see. Oh, that's beautiful, Morgan. Um, and uh, so this is where they, they have the chemosensory uh, area. 
And then their nematocysts, their stinging cells are really aggregated. There we go, thank you. These little rims, rings that you see along the tentacle, uh, kind of like a slinky, uh, that is where the nematocysts are really um, aggregated. And it looks like there's some nematocysts in those central areas as well. Um, and you can see on the rim of the bell, a little bulb right underneath that tentacle that, do you see it right in between the two big ones? A little one, yes. And um, I bet that's an eye spot. These, the, the rest of their life cycle is a hydroid that looks like a fuzzy, um, I don't know, like a fuzzy fern um, on the rocks. This is the Medusa stage that only lives for a couple of weeks, maybe um, a, uh, you know, maybe a month. Uh, and they're very tiny. You know, what do you think, uh, Morgan? Maybe the size of, if we put our, like the head of a pin? This one is a little larger than the head of the pin, of a pin. Maybe the two. Okay. Two. Yeah. Cool. And, and then I, right I've got something over it, here that's as small as the tip of the pin. <laughs> just let me say one thing and then I'll yeah, have yeah. that right below it. And it's just, attached to it right now is the larval stage of a copepod. So we are actually seeing a little baby copepod right there. So that's kind of cool. Oh, there it is. There it is. And when people think of plankton, they often, if they're of my generation or younger, like not, not in their 30s, but older than that, uh, SpongeBob SquarePants, you know, the evil, uh, culprit was the uh, was a copepod and that's a baby copepod. You can see the red eye spot and you could also see the, the heart beating a second ago. Oh, that's cool. Great view, Morgan. Yeah. You can go to the tiny, tiny. Good, you go for it. There it is. A zoomed in oh. version of Rhizosilinia. <laughs> so you can see how the ends taper to this point, like a needle. And can you see a, um, you can see the chloroplast, can you see like the nucleus or anything? Or are those the chloroplasts? I think that's just the chloroplast. Yeah, it's beautiful. I love can that background. Can you see background. if there are more than one? Can you see, can we see how they're joined together if you move down to the other side? That one's broken off. Yeah. <laughs> it broke. Oh, <laughs> I know. I think we're almost finished with our time. Maybe we can take one quick look. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, that's a cool one. What's that, Kendra? I don't know. I don't know. What's the other side look like? I mean, it could be a rise of selenia that had its ends chopped off or wait, oh, there, they go back up. Ah. A little bit more. It looked like they were joining together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd say that's the rise of selenia also. Yeah. No, swimming by, is that a really bacteria? Like that. What? Is that a bacteria that swam by? Little white thing? Could be. Yeah. Can we take one quick look at uh, Morgan's before we have yep. to say goodbye? I think okay, it's all yours, Morgan. I've got here what I'm not, we can't be sure if it's a microplastic, but it sure looks like one at first glance. Oh, oh yes. Right here. What do you think um, is, is, uh, I say that? yes, this is Nicole. I said those classic, the reds and the blues are the most classic. Yep, that's a sad, sad story. So we but, call that a microfiber, you guys. That's, a, that's an example of probably a fiber of plastic. Yep, absolutely. And you too can get involved with helping to make sure that that doesn't end up in the ocean. By doing okay, can we see that. if we can find a dinoflagellate? 
Yes, definitely we can. We didn't talk about those. Oh, and there's a different type of copepod. Yeah, so there's the two main types of copepods. One has the really long uh, antenna and those have short. Oh, go oh, for look, it. Oh, right there, there Yay. <laughs> Yay, dino, off the checklist. I'm gonna zoom in here. Okay. <laughs> so every, we've seen both types. So okay. this looks kind of like looking upside down, but, and I think, oh, so I think of dinoflagella as having like two feet and a head. And so those two feet are sticking up in the air and its head is kind of pointed down. And dinoflagellates have a pigment called peridinin that's a little bit more red. And so you can kind of see like those red spots in there and their pigments help them collect more light um, to use for photosynthesis. So beautiful. Yeah. Let me, let's see. What else? Oh. oh, we just have one more minute left to show you things here. Mm. Ah, there we go. Beautiful. Rise of selenium, lots of diatoms. Which is I just want to, oh, oh yes, there. look at that. Look at those, like several species of catoceras in that view. So there's the curly Q one, and then there's the one that's straight over on the left-hand side. And one of our members made the most beautiful glass art piece of Ketoceros that we just saw. Oh, and is that the larvation? Earlier we saw one of our relatives, a larvation that has a, uh, the beginning of a central nervous system and notochord. And that looks like a really weird view of it where you can see the tail on the lower part here, that uh, the notochord is in the middle and then there's a muscular part around it. And they actually are in the urochordate group. They are closely related to us, um, uh, relatively speaking, compared to everything else in this dish. Um, and you can see it has a mouth at the very end. Maybe uh, someone can point to that at the, the far end, uh, there we go, that's the mouth. And it has a pharynx that goes into the, uh, the has, uh, yeah, the mouth, the pharynx, the esophagus, the stomach. Um, it has a heart right in the middle there that uh, a little earlier we saw beating. And uh, so they are amazingly complex organisms and they are gelatinous plankton, zooplankton. Oh, I think we had a dino <laughs> It's so cool to, to see that something so tiny and microscopic could have such complex organs and structures. <laughs> Absolutely. Isn't that marvelous? And there's the poop. So important. <laughs> More of those down below. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kendra, Jane, Steve, and Morgan for showing us some of those amazing creatures. Um, that was a really lively sample, so I'm very excited <laughs> that we got to see that. We hope that you all enjoyed the presentation portion of tonight's event. And before we head into audience questions, I just wanted to reiterate that while our ocean undoubtedly faces many threats, and you know we explicitly talked about microplastics and microfibers being one of those, everyone is part of the solution. There are so many ways that you can join in community science projects, such as getting involved with the Plankton Monitoring Program, enrolling in the Cabrillo course, becoming a Save Our Shores Sanctuary Steward, or joining Save other Save Our Shores events as a volunteer. Understanding and monitoring the conditions on our beaches and oceans over time allows us the opportunity to understand baseline conditions, identify potential issues, and to address them quickly. The value and importance of community science data collection truly cannot be understated, with implications to oceanic, wildlife, and global human health. We hope that each of you will consider joining some of these initiatives and getting involved. And with that, I would like to ask if there's any questions from the audience. And I know Krista has been monitoring the chat. Thank you so much, Krista from Save Our Shores. 
she can share with us if anyone has any questions so far. And if you haven't put your question in the chat yet, go ahead and do so. Or you can use the raise hand feature on the reactions button um, and we can call on you to, to share your question out loud. Thanks, Emily. We did have one question from way back at the beginning of the evening. I think it was um, when we were talking about diatoms. And someone is wondering what percent of a diatom's body is silica and what percent is carbon? Kendra? <laughs> I don't know that off the top of my head. Ooh. Let's see. Can you be offended while I Google it? Let me see if I can Google it. <laughs> no problem. I would think that it would depend on, you know, what stage it's at too, right? Because they go through that amazing um, uh, splitting, asexual uh, division. And so it would probably depend on which diatom and what stage it's at. Krista, while we wait for a response on that one, are there any other questions that are coming up for folks? There was, yes, there was one for Jane when you were showing your slideshow and you showed some images of some drifters. Someone was wondering, there was an image of a circular one and they were wondering what type that was. Yes, that slide. And if those circular ones also use cilia to help them. <laughs> That's such a great question. I, I had to be so quick that I, you know, kind of zoomed by it. But this is, if you look, this is actually a progression of the, you know, many fish. Uh, they'll um, mate and then they'll release, well, they'll either release eggs and sperm into the water and they get together that and then they, you know, join in the water or some mate and then release, you know, fertilized eggs. So what we're seeing is a fertilized egg developing into a fish uh, larvae. And so you can see this big, I don't know if anyone can point for me, but the, um, you know, you can see the, the head of the fish on the left and then the, uh, you know, vertebrae of the, the fish going down in kind of like a J, but reversed. And then there's the uh, dot of um, the whole circle, the, the bigger circle too, is the oil droplet. And that's what keeps the uh, many of these um, zooplankton, it's oil droplets that keep them up in the water column. So this, you can see the fish has developed a lot more and uh, it is, you know, obviously going to get heavier, but uh, it's the oil droplets that really do it. And you can see even on like the porcelain crab larvae in the middle, you know, the long thin appendage is what works to keep it up in the water column. Um, and it does have, you know, the fine appendages uh, on it, but actually, this one isn't a good, none of the ones that are shown here is a good example of the cilia. But uh, if you think about the um, sea star larvae, it is really using that, you know, millions, probably hundreds of thousands of cilia. Thank you so much, Jane. Yeah. So did you have a response to the previous question or should we move on to? No, I got, I called a friend or actually I texted a friend or my boss. Okay. <laughs> and he reminded me that um, silica to nitrogen ratio is about one to one. And so the carbon to silica ratio would be about seven to one in a diatom. Oh, wow. great. Thank you. Thank oh. you, friend. Thanks, <laughs> Ray. <laughs> great. Krista, are there any other questions? Yeah, we've had a few come in just recently. Um, two of them are very similar. So I'll read both of them and if anyone would like to take them. But as the microplastic problem goes on, we're wondering if the sediment of our oceans is being changed by plastic snow that is reaching the bottom and are plankton being affected currently from the pollution in our oceans. I'll take a quick crack at that and then I'm sure others can, can add into it. 
um, we are finding plastic in the Marianas Trench, yeah? So we are finding it in the sediments at the deepest parts of our ocean. So we know that that plastic is raining down and affecting every single part of our ocean. However, it is sinking slowly. So it looks like we're gonna probably get some big pulses of plastic that hit the bottom as the biggest amount of plastics will make it down there because they're not down there yet. Um, and then the other question about the, the plankton being affected by the pollution in the ocean is a really great and super important question and one being investigated now. Um, plankton, as I'm not sure who here mentioned, but planktons have a lot of oils in them. They're very oily. And so they tend to attract oily pollutions or pollutions that are what we call hydrophobic, oil loving and water hating. And so they can tend to accumulate a lot of toxins like PCBs and even DDTs will do this. And that of course makes the plankton little vectors of pollution to organisms that are, are higher at higher trophic levels than they are like birds and sea lions. So they're definitely being affected by the pollutants in the ocean. Um, we also know that those pollutants can affect the nutrients and that will also affect plankton. So lots of different ways they can be affected and lots of research into it now. I'm sure others of you have some answers to that. Thanks, Nicole. Someone else is wondering if all of this microplastic in the ocean is contributing at all to sea level rise. That's a really good question. And I don't know that I even have an answer because a lot of plastic, so plastic, a lot of plastic initially will float. And then as it breaks down, it will um, slowly start to sink, mostly because it accumulates bacteria and stuff that kind of attach to it, and that will make it heavier and it will slowly start to sink. So, um, gosh, there's so much plastic in the ocean right now that, I mean, that's a really good question. I don't even know how to answer it, but it, it, it must be displacing some water, right? There's so much of it. I, I don't know how much, though. Good question. Yeah, I've never thought about that before, but I, I agree with you. It, it is truly something to think about. Well, it's creatures. probably abundant enough that it's displacing pods. Yeah. yeah. Pods found. And they know in the deep sea, uh, giant larvations have been taking in microplastics. So, uh, but in terms of sea level rise, I don't think we know that. That's something to go study for sure. Yeah, future study opportunity. <laughs> Yeah. And Pacific Plankton, you know, says wisely that uh, the contribution of sea level rise because of CO2 from the production, that the plastics contribute to sea level rise because of the CO2 from the production more than their volume. Yes, absolutely. That you think about the production of the plastics, the process of production of plastic is putting that into the atmosphere. And that is what needs to change. And, you know, getting a, a full circle economy where companies that make plastics need to know what the end point is. I think, you know, we just need to find alternatives. Yeah, thank you so much, Janai, for making that point and Jane too, for elaborating. And I just want to put a quick plug before we go on to more questions that uh, we just recently launched a plastic bottle petition um, at Save Our Shores. So we are trying to encourage our local Santa Cruz and Monterey legislators to pass legislation that will prohibit the sale of beverage bottles in plastic bottles. Um, so if you're interested in that, we can share that link in the chat. I think it has already been shared a few times. And um, please sign our petition if, if you want to support that type of legislation. And Emily, we had it, two more questions that we haven't gotten to yet. So if you're wondering why we haven't answered your question, it's coming. But one that I found really interesting and something that people probably don't think about a lot when we think of boats and ships in our ocean that can harm our megafauna like whales, do boat propellers and ships also harm plankton? I would say potentially, but they're so small that most of the forces that um, would act on them from a propeller or a boat are not anymore 
damaging than the swell or waves. And so I think with some of the more gelatin, Jane can speak to this, but I think maybe the zooplankton a lot more than the phytoplankton. I think the movement of the propeller would push things away, you know, so that it wouldn't, if, if the propeller was a suction type propeller, then it would be really damaging, but just the general, you know, propeller, I think would, would not, except for if it's very large, like the really large jellies. One of the big interactions between ships and boats and plankton is that ships from other countries that are traveling internationally bring ballast water and they are bringing invasive species into uh, the environment. So it's really important. Um, they're doing a lot of work now to um, treat their ballast water before they dump it or take on ballast water, they treat it because it could be a larvae of a fish that's invasive and it gets brought to Monterey Bay and takes hold. So something to think about that those planktonic larvae of these organisms do get affected by ships. Thanks, Lisa. I did have one final question for all of you. And a few people have asked this question. I know you've talked about joining your plankton monitoring program here locally and that classes are remote right now so people outside of the area can join virtually. But do you know of any plankton monitoring programs that people could participate in person in areas outside of the Monterey Bay such as the Sacramento River Delta or along the coast of Southern California? I don't. Um, I know there's been research that's been done up in the Sacramento Delta and regular plankton toes. I know Anna McGarrigan is on. Anna, you might be able to answer that. Anna was instrumental in developing the plankton program for Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and she's uh, in Rafe Cudella's lab and works with Kendra. Um, Anna, are you there? I know you talked about that study. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> no? no I can, I can, if Anna's not here, let me um, just put a little word in here that we, we have been able to expand our work with Lisa and others because of the fact that we're all in Zoom right now. So we have a number of people from other places that are contributing to the work. And one of the things that we've been talking about is that people, let's say from Southern California, can join the program either just learning on the Zoom or they can get access to their own plankton nets or find plankton nets um, in collaboration with people in their area, collect their own samples and then participate that way too. So we're looking at ways to expand, you know, sort of spatially uh, across the state for exactly some of these, the answer to some of these questions. So I think we're working on that. And um, we can, in fact, accommodate a lot of people right now because we're on Zoom and we will be on Zoom in the fall also. Our classes will be remote. Another thing I just thought of, um, CDPH, so the Department of Public Health, has a phytoplankton monitoring program. And so um, I think they were kind of limited on, on their supplies and what they can get out to volunteers, but you might want to check with them for sites down in Southern California. And, we, and we, the network currently, we do have sites up in San Francisco, Half Moon Bay, um, down to Monterey and Pebble Beach, as well as here in Santa Cruz. So we've really taken advantage of these fishing piers. There's over 47 fishing piers in California. So if you have a chance to get out to one, go through our training program, it'd be really great. We'd love to have you monitoring plankton and microplastics. Excellent. Thank you uh, to all the panelists for answering all those great questions. And thanks, everyone, for the amazing and thoughtful questions that we received. I just want to thank um, everyone who joined our event tonight. And thanks for your interest in learning about and protecting our beloved Monterey Bay and our oceans. I would also like to extend my deepest gratitude to our panelists for putting so much time and effort into making tonight's event so wonderful and to the Plankton Monitors and Cabrillo College TAs for all the incredible work that they do. 
Thank you so much for, to everyone for coming, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. I will be following up with an email with some links that we shared in the chat. Um, and if you have any last dire questions that you'd like me to send to our panelists, you can do that now before hopping off. But thank you so much to everyone for coming, and um, we hope you join us for more events in the future. And I want to say thank you to Emily and Save Our Shores for thank pulling you. us together to address this incredibly important topic. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, Thanks, thank Nicole. you, Emily, and all the staff, and Morgan and Steve uh, for projecting so well. That really made the huge difference. Um, we have to be currently, oh, okay, to sign the petition. Oh, so a uh, question for you, Emily. Uh, yeah. Do you have to be currently living in Santa Cruz or Monterey to sign the petition? Um, we are looking to get regional signatures right now, but um, go ahead and throw your, <laughs> throw your name in there, even if you're not local, because if we do expand the petition out um, to a wider geographic region, it'd be great to know that there are supporters in your area. And you know what, actually, I'd like to say that Maria, for example, who asked that is, is a, a Cabrillo student. So a lot of people who are living, uh, who are residing in Santa Cruz are not right now because they had to go to other places during the pandemic. So I would say in light of that, yes, if you're connected to this area, then for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Put that in your comment when you sign. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I'm going to stop my screen share and Krista, we can stop the recording.